Hello, uh, welcome to the MMU Philosophy Society podcast, The Quagmire. I'm here with my co-host, Aram. Um, my name is Harry, and we've got a guest on this week, Oscar, who is hey. he's an organiser for the um, a young Buddhist group that runs out of the Buddhist Centre in Manchester. Um, maybe, Oscar, you could introduce yourself and maybe say a little bit about the group. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I... Um, well... Uh, I've probably been involved in Buddhism for about um, seven or eight years, something like that. Um, and I started helping out a couple of years ago at the Young Buddhist stuff uh, in Manchester, basically just like for a sense of community. And I just find it really, really interesting. And it's helped my life a lot as well. So, yeah. You gave a talk because uh, this Monday we had a meeting and uh, you gave a, like a speech about like you and another Buddhist like who had been there for a while gave a speech about how um, impactful it had been on your life and that kind of thing and how you got into it. And uh, I thought yeah. that was very interesting like what you were saying. Like uh, how did you get into it? Like what, what drew you to Buddhism in the first place? Well, um, basically at school, at secondary school, I was like... Um, pretty shy and like I had friends and stuff but I I was pretty kind of reserved really like the 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 actual reason why I started was because I wasn't very good with girls and um I I got into self-help um because I wanted to to improve myself and and basically be more attractive uh that was that was the initial reason so I got into self-help and then um discovered this book uh, called A New Earth by this guy Eckhart Tolle. Um, he's not a Buddhist, but he's like, he's a bit like, a little bit new agey. It's like, it's very straightforward, like basic, just live more from the present moment, like talks a lot about kind of ego structure and all this kind of stuff. But anyway, this book just totally blew my mind. And then ever since then, really, I've, I've, been involved in some form um i couldn't really put it down after that i was about to say like um you say you used to um because you want to like you know get girls and stuff like would would you say that um you know that motive like would some kind of like broke down the mental barrier you like get when talking to girls and um, correct me if i'm wrong but um would you say something like would some like broke down that barrier and allowed you to speak more freely like you know be more willing to ask someone out on a date like do you say that's the, like the case? Um, I think I think Buddhism can. There's no guarantee. Some people become more um, reclusive. You know, they 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 kind of move away from people more through getting involved, and some people become more confident and or more outgoing. I should say, and I think um, I think getting to know yourself on a deeper level is always beneficial and it may result in you being more at ease with people like I would say that that's been the case for me um but to be honest like after being involved in Buddhist stuff or or just spiritual stuff for um for a while I guess the hmm, how would I put it I guess the like that kind of took over in terms of the that the reason why I was involved in Buddhism at a certain point became because I was really into Buddhism, not because the initial thing was an, it was kind of an ulterior motive, you know. It was like I'm doing this thing because I want this thing, or, you know, like I want more confidence or whatever. When after a certain amount of time, it was just like, well, actually, this thing is just really cool and interesting. So, yeah. That's kind of like um, the romance, like, or the chick flick movies where the guy's, like, dared to go out with, like, a girl or whatever, to, like, for money or whatever, then eventually he ends up, like, loving the girl for, like, the goal is the actual girl, not the money. So it's kind of like that in a way. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting now that you brought up uh, Agar Tool, because uh, this is kind of what I wanted to talk about, because... Uh, it seems like there's a commonality between a lot of different um, religious and spiritual paths. Like you, you, your first introduction to this, to the kind of spiritual area of life was through Eckhart Tolle. 
and, it, and then like it seems to me like maybe you reached out to the Buddhism thing because that there are certain similarities between like Buddhism and a lot of different kind of strands of uh, like religions and stuff like for instance like a lot of Eastern religions like Zen, Taoism, Hinduism they all seem to share like a kind of common core would you would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think from my perspective, it's like, you, they're all basically talking about the same thing. And I, like in, in a more like, obviously there are, um, uh, traditions when, within each of these like, uh, religions that emphasize this kind of central point more than others, you know, it's like Christianity or like Catholicism, whatever, like, might be actually i don't want to point them out particularly but there's some it's like i think within religions things can get more and more abstract and then that initial like thing that that binds them together becomes obscured but you know it's like i read rumi and like you know and he's like muslim and you know it's like it doesn't they're talking about the same thing maybe more the mystical side of the religions but like i i think it's because you know what's talked about in buddhism or by Eckhart Tolle is not it's not a concept it's like it's it's a um it's something that you can test in your experience it's not just an idea that you're adopting it's something that you are like properly able to investigate in your is this true in my experience and that was something that the buddha emphasized was like don't take this on as an idea or an ideology like you need to test it to see if it works there's no point of you just adopting more ideas that's not going to help anyone so i think it's that experiential aspect of really going in and kind of testing these things and I, yeah i do think there is a massive similarity between a lot of them yeah it's all about a, a kind of common experience like like what's left over when you get rid of all concepts and all ideas like what what remains after you kind of divest yourself of all beliefs so what 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 would you say that common experience is between that that all those different traditions are talking about <laughs> uh, that's a big one um difficult one to talk about i guess <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> i think it's um again it's it's something experiential so if if your thinking mind is to quieten which is possible say on a buddhist retreat or just it can happen spontaneously it can happen through reading whatever if it is to quiet quieten i think it's what is there then i mean it's always innate but it becomes very obvious then and I think what that is, or well, I don't know what it is, but it's very mysterious and kind of very open and inclusive and, you know, um, but it is something that is experienced and then like poets and stuff trying to dance around it and make something of it in words and all that kind of stuff and doing it some justice, but not really. So yeah it's definitely something experienced not something that can be captured yeah, so, very well in concepts but yeah i was about to say um i think a good comparison to make is like between buddhism like if you compare like traditional religion science and buddhism um kind of have um there's the mystical elements of the religion in buddhism but also there's like you know parts that are quite that seem quite scientific like um the, so, for example, this self-investigation is like a scientific experiment. It's like an experiment on the consciousness in a way. So in that fashion, um, would you say it's kind of like you're trying to, f a lot of the time you're finding, um, would I prefer to be more around people or less around people? Because people may either become a lot more sociable or they'll basically become like hermits. I think it... Um... So is the question there, do you, do you, could you maybe reword the question? Okay, like, um, like it was more of um, like my, from like what I can see so far, like my mm. view on it, but so would you say that um, Buddhism, would you agree with me that Buddhism 
is quite scientific in the way it it seeks to investigate rather than just you know <clears throat> go by a particular text but at the same mm. time it's, would you say oh, it's yeah, yeah. religious because it appeals to like more mystical spiritual like values yeah i i get um yeah for sure i mean it, it's it's you know the emphasis on on meditation for example is because that is a practice that it, it encourages you to investigate and explore what is actually going on it's not like it's not like if you get the right ideas mm -hmm. that that's it like that just isn't it so in buddhism like there's this quite interesting there's this guy called adyashanti who's a he was he was a zen buddhist i don't think he would label himself as that now but you know what he said was that he he runs retreats and he's a very like kind of um awakened sort of person like i have to elaborate on what i mean by that but and what what he says is he he does retreats with people and gets them to sit and essentially do nothing for like really really long periods of time and the reason that he does that is because you can't avoid what is going on when you're just sitting and doing nothing for really really long periods of time so the danger with any spiritual tradition is that you just adopt new ideas and they can be helpful but that is not what is being pointed at it's not an adoption of ideas right so that's a danger and so his solution to it is like okay get all the spiritual ideas you could possibly want they can be as most glamorous and lovely ideas as as you want and now you're going to sit for a week and do nothing and then what 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 are your ideas worth then you know like when you sat for that long just with your bare experience are you still saying that you've got it all figured out so so that emphasis on 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 experience is really really important i think there was another thing that you said about religion and potentially like a distinction there um yeah you you meant i'm i'm just kind of aware that um people that i know who i see as very spiritual kind of spiritually deep people um would also very much associate themselves with being religious mm -hmm. and um i think it is definitely possible to have like it like there's obviously a connection between religion and kind of blind faith for example but um that is something hopefully that we're kind of slowly letting go of that connection because religions i think are basically just like at their core you know we're kind of we're getting spirituality and then we're kind of organizing around it that's kind mm -hmm. of it you know we're, we're getting people together we're having some kind of ideas that we like to associate ourselves with it's just some kind of organization around these quite mystical things and i i think that's fine that but there is a lot of room for them to go wrong i think as well yeah i guess like if the focus is experience like so for instance if you like you were saying where you sit quietly by yourself and you just like i guess what would happen is your thoughts would kind of like sink back after a certain amount of time like and, and you would kind of stop thinking at a certain point and it seemed it's like what's interesting to me is like what happens when you've got no thoughts because like for instance like if you have no thoughts you can't make a distinction between yourself and the world kind of thing like all of these kind of belief structures like that that like you are saying um like the religion is like a calcified belief structure that forms kind of thing and like when those drift away you can't distinguish between yourself and another or you can't distinguish between like what you do and what happens to you kind of thing and and everything just becomes like this kind of flow like would you say that that is like um that experience of everything being one would you say that that is uh, enlightenment or awakening or something like that um not being able to tell where you end and the world begins kind of thing i don't know if i can give a answer on that because there, there definitely has been a point when i've thought that 
Um, but I don't, hmm. I guess my experience of investigating this stuff is that there is, in a way, I don't know how ordinary that can be in a, in a way. And, and the people that I would define as being enlightened people probably wouldn't expect, wouldn't describe their constant experience as that necessarily. Um, so I kind of wonder if it is, if it's an aspect of being enlightened, but it isn't the continuous experience of being enlightened. No, like, um, I was about to say that, um, maybe different people have like different interpretations. Like, so someone like Harry would interpret it that way. Like whereas another enlightened person would interpret like their experience in another way. Like there isn't really one way to interpret one's experience because at the end, end of the day is ultimately subjective i'd argue definitely when you're when you are trying to because we are conceptualizing it and as long as we're talking about it then that's not it you know we're kind of just we are still skirting around it so we're just having a nice time doing that but it's never going to get all of it i i don't uh, yeah i don't know to harry's question i i don't know actually i um yeah it could be <laughs> i i'm not but i'm not actually too sure i mean what how would how would i be sure but yeah it's like yeah there just does seem to be this factor where people that seem quite awakened do describe experiencing separation at times or identification with their mind at times and yet they they are very awake as people so yeah not, not too sure like as as part of the uh, young buddhist thing we do like a check-in meeting where we come and and we like talk about all of our own practices kind of thing and how we've been doing with the practice and i mean i don't i don't really practice like buddhist meditation or anything but it, mm. it, in terms of like my spiritual practice like that does seem to be the place that I'm gravitating towards like that place of kind of like no self. Not, uh, like I'm not saying that I'm experiencing that constantly or whatever, but it does seem like that's the direction that it's heading kind of thing where it's like, mm. you know how in Buddhism it talks about no self, like empty body, empty mind kind of thing where it's like you become like a ball in a river, like where you just kind of like choicelessness kind of thing. Mm. Like, like, and it does seem like that would be <clears throat> what's meant by like liberation because if you were in that kind of state where you couldn't distinguish between the world and yourself, you would be liberated from making decisions and kind of, you would just kind of flow along with life, wouldn't you? That would, would fit the kind of, fit the bill kind of thing. I wonder if, um, if there's a difference between not being able to make that distinction and, and knowing that it wasn't real. Because I think they are different like you can really deeply know say for example like there's the like um analogy of like playing a board game right it's like you can be completely invested in the game and like playing the game and at the same time be having fun because you know that it's not ultimately real you know you are playing a game and i think so i don't and I think that might be linked somehow to this of in that maybe you're not, it's not that you can't make a distinction between inside and outside or whatever. Like there seems to be some like blurry, maybe even conceptual idea of like, Oh, I'm in here and they're out there, but deep, deep experiences that you've had are strongly suggesting that that is not, the truth of it that's not the actual case i don't know if there is an end point of that you are just in a continuous state of non-separation like you just can't actually you, you you're kind of unable to see the difference all the time but maybe some people are in that state i think yeah but but definitely the way that the the way that i'm kind of seeing it now i guess is is that um 
I want to know that deeply enough that that the seriousness of life can can kind of lift mm -hmm. so that so that it's a very strong conviction that this is the case that and then obviously I do go into states where that feeling of separation is is loosened and then I come out of them but that the conviction from those states that I've been in that that is much more true leads to me living a life that is much more open and less serious and much more connected with with people yeah I like what you said about um about the states about going into those states I mean I'm not sure that I've ever had like any spectacular experience of that it, it's more just like if you if you ask yourself like where is the boundary between what I call myself and what I call the world you can't like put your finger on it you know like that's the surprising thing that mm. we've built like because of the way we've been educated it seems like we've kind of taken that kind of idea to heart like that there is some kind of distinction there but then when you just ask yourself the simple question like where's the boundary it just you know it's kind of absent you know yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, also what you said about the world not being real was interesting you know like how you used the example of the board game and you said that like you're playing the game but you know that it's not real like what would you elaborate on that like what do you mean like not real like the world isn't real because i think that that's a point of confusion with like buddhism and stuff when buddhists say the world isn't real like what what do they mean uh i meant it in regards to um kind of i build my world all that i'm constantly propping up and building my my world through through concepts through my ideas of other people you're over there i'm over here and i i'm this character you have that character I'm happy, I'm sad, whatever it might be. Uh, it's not my direct experience of life. It is a conceptual model I have of life. And the game is that. That is the, is the concept, is the ideas that I have about things. So um, seeing that the, I could, I could say like seeing that the world that I've made conceptually is not fixed it like that's not the truth of it that isn't you know the world that i've made conceptually is completely different from the world arams made conceptually or that you've made conceptually like or or whoever has you know like it's none of them are like the truth of it none of them are real but it's fine that's that's i'm not trying to avoid that you know like i do have thought and therefore that is an inevitable function of mind is to build these models of things like that i'm not gonna there's gonna be no point when that's not gonna be the case i don't think and and it's very useful but obviously it causes me a huge amount of suffering as well because i take it to be real i take it i take my idea of you know, at the moment I'm like working full time and stuff and it's on the computer a lot and da da da. And I kind of get up in the morning and I'm thinking, oh, I've got to go to work. Like, that's annoying. I have to like sit at my computer all day. That's a pain. And it's because, and I'm suffering with that idea because I've created this amorphous conceptual blob of like work and expectation and something I have to do. That isn't, that's not what, you know, I'm drinking a cup of coffee in the morning. Like that's not my direct, ex my direct experience is never like work. Like this is just this, you know, so I'm suffering by some like weird construction I made about work is not my time. That's someone else's time. And I have to do what other people tell me. And, and I'm, that's just making me suffer, you know, that idea. So it's more about that of being able to see, oh, that's not, it's not real you know I'm, I'm i'm just making up this thing called work where that i don't like and that you know whatever adding adding to that but yeah i was about to say in a way like buddhism can really help with because a lot of people fear the lack of control over their like current situation or whatever like in a way this bud like buddhism can like, really help people suffering from that fear uh, would you would you argue that or so um 
what in in the sense because you don't really have control ultimately no. stuff like uh, work and stuff yeah i guess um i guess if you really follow it through and you practice for a long time that is the case for sure but i think initially if if you tell someone initially like you you don't actually have any control that might be a bit disconcerting <laughs> i don't know if people would really like that you know sometimes i'm scared by that you know so um yeah as again as an idea yeah it's it it might not be that helpful as the experience of like sit, say you're sitting in meditation and you're watching as um thoughts are literally just arising on their own in the mind like because i very much think that i am thinking that's most of my experience of being alive is oh i'm thinking about this and i'm thinking about that and da 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 and then you sit in meditation and you just watch how thoughts are actually just these kind of bubbles and they're kind of pretty much uncontrolled like even the ones that i feel like i'm squeezing out of my brain somehow when i actually go into that experience i don't find the base where it's like oh there's me and i'm like popping these thoughts out right like so the thing that i feel i have most control over which is like my own thinking mm -hmm. i actually don't and having and see and seeing that say in in your experience in meditation for example can be either really scary or really liberating because from a control perspective like a more egoic perspective is terrifying because then you know like all of these plans and ways that i'm trying to keep hold of this idea that i have of my life suddenly don't seem particularly stable anymore from the liberation perspective it's like ah oh, you know that's a relief i'm not i never was i don't have to tense my body and imagine i'm like rigidly needing to needing to create some thoughts you know or whatever like it, it's yeah yeah like um i suppose to say like it's just um again like from what i'm gathering like buddhism is it's all about like perspective um let's say someone who's like early like early into buddhism mm. they get that realization that it might be extremely scary for them it might you know shatter their world for you but someone who is like you know trained in it has practiced like you know meditation has done a lot within that buddhism like they'll they'll be able to reframe that thought in a way that's very positive i'll just allow them to live like freely yeah no yeah for sure for sure yeah. um i was about to say um <clears throat> also how do you think buddhism would tie into the theory of like i've heard of optimistic nihilism or not <laughs> i'm interested i i i'm not sure um what that means but i'm interested to hear the definition of it okay basically um optimistic nihilism it's um it's that nothing matters it's like taking the principles of nihilism that nothing really like you know ultimately matters will we'll all die where it's like bags of like flesh and stuff that are eventually gonna rot away but mm. Due to that, we could experience our, like, you know, experience to the fullest extent. We could have the best time. Like, you know, we can. We should savor everything. Like, how do you think Buddhism would tie into such a philosophy? <laughs> yeah, I'm just imagining my friend Tom, like, this, this would be an <laughs> interesting conversation to have with him. Um, I think, uh, yeah. Buddhism is very broad, you know, different traditions yeah. emphasize different things. So that's one thing to say initially. Um, I'd say probably what makes it not that um, optimistic yeah. nihilism is that ethics are hugely important within Buddhism mm -hmm. um, and an emphasis on compassion and and others and stuff that yeah. that maybe wouldn't be prioritized with the view that nothing matters and mm -hmm. just just have as good time as you can possibly have potentially but you know obviously someone who does hold that view would would probably argue otherwise but like i think there is 
a real emphasis in Buddhism of interconnection and influence. Mm-hmm. And essentially that um, I've been thinking about it. This is probably a bit simplistic, but I do find it helpful of like Buddhism really is, is essentially saying that your vibe as a human being is so important is like paramount because there's so much more going on in terms of how we influence the world than we're aware of. Like, it's not simply like, Oh, I've given to charity and done my bit of, you know, of good contribution to the world or the other way around. Like, you know, you've done something shit and whatever it's, it's so much more like the, the web and threads that we have are so much more than that, that, by by really the aim of buddhism is to is to become enlightened and essentially free yourself from suffering that i mean that mm-hmm. that's what buddhism is about but it's like by investigating your experience and seeing through these kind of delusions that we have that means that our kind of frequency or our kind of our vibe as a person becomes comes transform so when we meet people the most subtle threads of connection that are happening there mm-hmm. all the time whether we like it or not are going to be a lot more um positive and have a positive influence over over other people and be inspiring and helpful towards them in ways that you can imagine and the other way so it's like you can be you can be an activist who's like devoted their life to whatever cause but you can be a shit person you know like like a really really difficult and unpleasant person and essentially that's putting at more abstract ethics like Mm -hmm. a bigger cause in front of your the more direct ethics and influence that you have when you just meet people you know like because we're affecting people all the time without knowing it so Mm -hmm. The emphasis in Buddhism really is that we're, you know, and I don't know if this counters what you're talking about with optimistic nihilism at all, but it's, we have so much influence as people just in the sort of energy that we bring to situations. Buddhism is, is kind of emphasizing that, is saying by becoming enlightened, the, the, what you can give to the world simply through your presence is so much it's just huge. It's so inconceivably big. So mm-hmm. th- that is what's emphasized within Buddhism. Yeah. How do you, what, what's your idea of um, enlightenment? Uh, just roughly, I mean, you, you know, like, uh, what, what, what's... I get, I guess it's, um, it's not dissimilar to the game kind of analogy uh, that we were talking about earlier, but, you, I think, um, and this could easily not be a Buddhist view, so I, I just want to emphasize that, but this is just what I've, I haven't um, exclusively been into Buddhism, so this is sort of my cobbled together version, but um, I think, yeah, it's, I think it's seeing is seeing essentially that at your core you are this you're gonna love this harry like indivisible awareness you know like this 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 presence um that is you at your core and and it's not um uh and then the other things such as thought and conceptualizing and all this kind of stuff, it somehow lies on top of that. And there is, there is individuality, obviously, because we all have the different makeup. You know, we're kind of, we seem to be things arising within my awareness is different to yours and da, 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 da. So there is, there is differences, I guess, but it's essentially, it's recognizing, oh, I am not my thoughts and stuff like that. I am this um experience 
like a pre- like a presence i don't yeah it's hard to yeah and and through this recognition your relationship with everything in life is totally transformed so your then thoughts and basically your suffering will largely like die away and therefore the way that you relate to others your kind of level of inclusivity and openness with others and stuff becomes totally transformed as well and but i i, I want to kind of state again that i don't know if anyone is in this is exclusively in that place so i think even people that have are that i would describe as enlightened are not always enlightened and they're, they're not always in that state of complete openness um and inclusivity and st- you know they they will c- just come back into thought for periods and out and da, 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 da. but it seems to be a shift it seems to be a shift of like your predom- you're predominantly in this place of of openness and recognizing yourself as this presence uh, and then you kind of go back into the narrow thinking place occasionally too so that was a bit clunky but anyway something along those lines <clears throat> you recognize yourself as that presence so so really you are that all the time but you you kind of you're deluded into thinking that you're not by thoughts yeah and i guess there's different um yeah other like yeah different traditions of buddhism would define all this quite differently you know like there's um like what i was saying in this talk the other day you know it really appeals to me this idea that the spiritual path is one of uncovering in innate this innate whatever we've just been talking about that is that is there all the time and that that is shrouded and and kind of covered by all of our conditioning and cultural conditioning and human conditioning and all this kind of stuff is kind of covering it but it's it's always there whereas other traditions really emphasize that it well it's there's more of a cultivation aspect to it and i'm not going to explain how that works but that that is the emphasis that they have so yeah, it does vary a lot. Because uh, in, in philosophy, say, um, sorry. Um, now you carry on, Harry. I was just going to say that, like in philosophy, there's like a branch of philosophy called metaphysics, which is like uh, your kind of large scale view of the world, like how you see the nature of reality, kind of thing. So, like, I was just wondering how how that thing that you were saying about presence, like, so what would be uh, like your understanding of reality? So, like, I was saying that there is like a really existing physical world. Or are we saying that there's just this presence and what reality is, is this presence? Or are we saying that somehow the presence is like inside a physical body or like what, how, would you, how would you kind of elaborate your view of like the nature of reality kind of thing? Yeah, it's interesting. I, might, I lived in a um, Buddhist community for a year up until like a few months ago. And um, being in that community did shift my perspective on this a bit because there would have been a the the perspective that there is just awareness or that there is just consciousness uh is quite an advaita perspective um and i can hear my um one of my housemates uh garavachitta saying that's not buddhism it you know because it is a hypothesis you know it's not based on yes your direct experience might always be that there is awareness there but that is not you by the jump between the fact that i only ever experience awareness and that that is all there is that is a huge jump to make and buddhism in theory buddhism doesn't make um uh it doesn't make judgments of that because you can't discover it in your direct experience whether or not that that's actually the case it's it's kind of a it's it's um 
yeah, it's like a hypothesis about what could actually, what could be true. Whereas Buddhism is very much based in, all right, what is your experience? And supposedly all of, all of Buddhist philosophy is based on someone's experience that has had very, very deep meditative states or enlightened experiences and stuff like that. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, I guess when it gets into that area, it's like, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know if anyone really knows. You're saying that Buddhism doesn't kind of make like statements like of doctrine. It's more of like a, a prescription for getting rid of suffering, and that and that's it. Just sticks with that kind of thing. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. What we were saying before about like the core of these religions and like um, because Buddhism, like like how you got into Buddhism through Eckhart Tolle, and like it all kind of blends together because they do seem to share a core, you know. And I would mm. say that, that that core is that kind of awareness only perspective, you know, like because. Like you were saying how you couldn't know it it, it requires <laughs> i suppose it does require a leap uh, I, I don't know just it seems to me that that's what liberation would be you know like how it, that, they're constantly talking about like paths ways to be liberated you know and, it, and if all there is is this presence then it's inherently liberating because it's like it's indestructible it's infinite kind of thing and if that's yourself then you've got nothing to worry about kind of thing you know what i mean it's like, I was about to say, like, maybe um, that's because that's like how he's perspective of liberation, not necessarily because that is the one liberating idea, because as he said, um, that it doesn't seem very like Buddhist to say that there is one idea of liberation, like someone's idea of liberation is to see that, say that, oh, everything's like that, like separate, but interconnected and stuff. Like, there's many different ways you can at the situation and that's why in a way how his like, idea isn't necessarily like contradictory with buddhism yeah I, I it's there's a clear distinction for me between what you can discover yourself uh through your your experience of being a human being and what I can then um, try and figure out what might be true based on that. And obviously I do that all the time anyway, you know, like for example, I'm constantly trying to make assessments of my future based on what's happened in my past. And a lot of the time it's accurate and a lot of time it's not accurate, but, but it's, it's still a hypothesis about what could happen and i would say that um i would say that buddhism does have a view of what of i mean it talks about truth you know and and even that's quite a dangerous word in a way to use in these kinds of discussions because it's it's it um suggests that there is one truth and in a way that that connection point between all the religions is what is being referred to as truth. Um, but I would say that the, I guess it seems important that distinction where I would agree with you, Harry, up until the point of that, that point of saying, and that is all there is, because I don't know, you know, like I, it's, I don't know, um, I don't know if the world is made of awareness or made of consciousness or not. You know, I, I don't know really, I would have to make an assumption about that. Um, but I do know that I am aware and I do know that I can't find, I can't find the edge of that awareness. I do know that. So I can base something off that. I don't know if that makes sense. And and I think um, to what you were saying, Aram, like, I think it's really interesting to explore this idea of like one, is there one um, truth? truth? Um, and my suspicion is that there is, <laughs> but I don't think any of us have really explained it. I, I don't think any human really has got it right you know in, in actually what it is there's there seems to be a unified experience of being 
alive, at least as a human being, which is this, that we are expressions of life, that we are aware, like that's the only thing we know is that we are aware, right? And like, that is a unified experience. Mm -hmm. There's something in there that is the base of, and what is talked about with truth, I think, um, is coming to a base point of like, all right, this, this is something that beyond all my ideas and all these religions ideas, this lies at the root of, of all of it. And I have a suspicion that that is the case, but I definitely don't think it's a Buddhist thing. And I don't think it's a Hindu thing. And I don't think it's a whatever, like, I don't think anyone's found it and able to capture it in a philosophy or, or an idea. It's not, I don't think it's possible to do that. So yeah. Yeah. Wait, that sounds quite Hegelian. Like that sounds pretty Hegelian, like um, sort of dialectic trying to find the ultimate idea in a way, but like whereas Hegel had his own like conceptions on what that actually was, um, could Buddhism not be like considered like a never ending Hege like Hegelian dialectic? So was that um is that the idea that well is that yeah, the idea that you can find an ultimate mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, like but um rather like Hegel said that we probably could. Like there's always like <clears throat> well, as Hegel said, we could find like the ultimate idea eventually. Would you argue that um, it's kind of like we're all in this search for the ultimate idea, but the search is never ending? I just don't think it's possible. No. Because it's, it's it, an idea is conceptual, it's, it's of the mind. Mm -hmm. Our thoughts are always relative. There's no, there's always opposites, there's always they exist within parameters they just have to exist within parameters if it exists within parameters you can't describe something that is limitless you're not going to find the words which are inherently constricting or limited to describe something that is inherently not those things it i don't think i think it's like an un is unsolvable in that way and i think like zen definitely emphasizes that it's like through the co koans and stuff like that it's like these riddles that are kind of impossible and they kind of break your the intention of them is to get you beyond trying to figure it, it's getting you beyond the thinking mind it's getting you beyond the conceptual models but how do we you know like we're literally addicted to thinking like there's no other way of putting it and how do you get a species that is addicted to thinking to go beyond thought you have to use something quite radical and weird and like a koan is that you know and like and i think that kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier you know it's just like what is what is there when the thought dies down or what is there when you know, not that there's no thought even, but when thought is quiet enough that it's more of a whisper and you can become more aware of other stuff that's going on, what's going on inside your body and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, that's where all the really interesting stuff happens. You know, it's not like, I love talking about ideas and I think they can be a springboard to kind of more direct experience, but all the real magic happens in Buddhism or in this area of spirituality when you just shut up <laughs> uh, or, or, or you just, it's like on a retreat, like you're, mm. like you're, you're spending, you know, in my case, days and days, but some people spend months and months, whatever, years and years sitting and just letting your mind settle and seeing what happens and really interesting things happen you know it's just there's no it's it's just cool it's just so cool you know like um anyway 
Yeah. And again, um, when you say that, I start to think, um, oh, I might never reach enlightenment because I just love thinking about these ideas so much. Like, um, for me, it's not just like something that I have to do based on my nature. It's something I love. So how would you contrast the love? Like, how for someone who loves like ideas so much, mm. how would you re like reconcile that with Buddhism? Well, it's not... It's ideas are really interesting and they can be a sprint like they're very helpful and unhelpful but in this case for you you know it's just like this is the best use of ideas mm -hmm. because it's it's using ideas to get beyond ideas you know it's like it's 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 i don't know there's nothing there's absolutely nothing wrong with it you know and it's like i, th I think it's a very enjoyable thing to do and like and can be extremely helpful we're using models all the time so why not exchange them with ones that actually work and help mm -hmm. us to suffer less you know like there's so there's so many lists in but it's not like buddhism's mm -hmm. blank you know it's like there are ridiculous amounts of lists and that's why i didn't want to talk about like specifically buddhist no. philosophy because i don't know you know i can't remember the lists you know there's so many of them like there's that and they are help they're helpful maps like mm -hmm. that's that's how they're kind of talked of you know these are like maps that the maps aren't the terrain you know you there's a clear difference between you're looking at a map and the actual space that you're in mm -hmm. they're helpful guides and can be very interesting but that is not the same as the, the experience itself so there's nothing wrong with it it's like great i love like chatting about this stuff it's so good you know so it's like um let's say like ideas are kind of like um <clears throat> good food like or sensory places like you definitely indulge in them but they're not the end goal like you can definitely have the ideas but to view a sensory pleasure as the end goal is ultimately like just a flawed world view yeah, or, or it's not gonna. It. It's not going to give you what you really want, on in a deeper what you know, on a deeper level. You know, it's like if I if I spend. If I get obsessively into like. You know, I do art stuff, so it, I have little bouts of like, getting really into art and like producing and creating and stuff like that. It's like it's really fun and and it and. It, and I do enjoy it a lot, but after a certain amount of time, then it, some deeper part of me yearns to just to just stop or to just not be so in my mind or be so in thought. Like, and I guess maybe maybe there's a suggestion in Buddhism that th that point of recognizing a yearning for something beyond ideas and thought will happen at some point in everyone's life, whether it's at age, you know, five or on your deathbed, it's going to happen at some point. And yeah, Buddhism's just saying, well, you know, you can get started on investigating this stuff now. <laughs> I don't, but yeah, maybe that doesn't work, but. I do like the aspect of Buddhism, like how, uh, unlike other religions like um, Christianity and um, Islam, it doesn't have such a strict attitude towards like things like sensual, like um, sensual pleasures and stuff. It's not so much that like you can't do something; it's more like it tries to redirect your energy somewhere else, kind of thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's, more, it's, a, it's a kinder, kinder religion to follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More kind of easy going, you know, more of like a cool dude religion. <laughs> I think that's why people are drawn towards it and it hasn't had as much scrutiny as other religions probably although there are issues with it I think like it yeah like some of the stuff that I've been exploring at the moment is around like um, the kind of fear desire mechanism which is like quite at the core of Buddhism of, of um, at the core of suffering is greed hatred and delusion so <clears throat> essentially the mechanism of pushing things away 
trying to pull things towards and not really being aware that you're doing that and that that's causing you suffering. So that that's really um, a very kind of core teaching. And so I feel quite close to this thing of like sense pleasures and should I, shouldn't I, and da, 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 da. Like, and the, the learning or the, when I'm actually, when it's making sense, the Buddhist stuff in regards to that is, is not when I'm like, when I'm um, saying, oh, I ought to not be having desire or I ought to not be having aversion or fear of people. Like it's, there's no, as the saying goes, it's, um, it's Buddhism, not shouldism. <laughs> and it's, uh, so this aspect of shoulding, like, oh, I should, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't want to drink beer or I shouldn't want to eat cake or I, sh I shouldn't be feeling so pissed off at this person. If there's a shouldn't or in there or should, then that's not it. So, but exploring like, um, the, exploring what is happening you know it's like so what's really interesting is like when i'm when i have desire for something say like i'm like i really want yeah to go and eat some cake in the fridge what is going on there is is there is some story which is saying i am incomplete i am not enough this thing will make me enough like there is a missing piece to me now and this cake is going to fill that missing piece that's like that's what's going on and that's what i feel in my body so even desire even though we associate it with something positive that what is actually going on in my experience is i'm saying i am this moment is wrong it's incomplete it will be right when i have this thing i am not enough right now i will be enough when i um when i you know put something on instagram or whatever you know it's like so innate, like intrinsic within desire or is, is this aspect of this moment is not right. This, this is, this moment is wrong or incomplete in some way. And on that level, it's the same as fear. You know, it's, it's the two sides of the same coin. It's just like fear is saying this thing shouldn't be happening. This is a wrong experience and I don't want it. And desire is saying, that thing should be happening, but it's not here. And so this moment is wrong. And both of them are, are the same thing. It's saying, this is wrong. This is wrong. What's happening now is wrong. So exploring that is like, it's not a case of, I shouldn't be having, having desire. It's that desire, I suffer. The experience of desire, when you really look at it, is of suffering. And Buddhism is about, um, going beyond suffering so it yeah it, it's really psychological it's just like looking at these things and saying oh actually my experience of desire is, is unpleasant it doesn't actually feel good when i really look at it so when you let those desires drop away all that's left is the the presence and that's inherently fulfilled inherently content well i guess um if you see if you see that those desires are making you suffer, they will naturally fall away on some level. If you really see, oh, this is, this is hurting me, it will naturally fall away. But the, the danger is that, the des and this is where it gets very convoluted, but you have a desire to have no desire, or you have a desire to have no fear. Or I, again, it gets into should, you know, and it's so easy, I do it all the time, it's like, Oh, I shouldn't be desiring or I, or I, I really would like to be able to drop my desire right now so I can be present in the moment. And it's, it's just another form and it's very, it's very sneaky, but it's that thing of like, this moment's wrong. And the true moment is me feeling in pure awareness and open and loving. And, you know, that's the, that's what I want, but that's not me right now. And I need to get there. And that's just, not, it's just the same, it's the same mechanism. So it's really, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy, which is why it takes a long time to train and yeah. <laughs> what, I like about, what I like about, um, don't worry, what I like about um, Buddhism from what I'm hearing is, well, I love the religions are like, 
reject desire, but some attempts to refrain desire. Like there's a lot of stuff like, in religions like don't eat out, al- don't eat pork, don't drink alcohol, like don't have sex until like marriage. Whereas Buddhism doesn't really have those rules because it's more of like reframing rather than like rejecting. Yeah. And there are, there are precepts, you know, so there are sort of guidelines, you know, it's just like at some point it was written down that intoxicants, like getting off your face, isn't very con- conducive to enlightenment or stealing isn't very conducive to enlightenment or is causing you suffering and other people suffering. So it's probably better to not do that. It's not, but you're not going to be punished for doing it but it's it's like just it's kind of like saying just to let you know what this doesn't work the thing that you're trying to do here it doesn't work if you're wanting to not suffer stealing or murdering or you know getting off your face supposedly that's not going to work for this particular thing that you're trying to do here that's kind of more of what buddhism is saying i i think (laughs) yeah of getting off, thing of like getting off your face and stuff. There's as some people would argue that um, psychedelics can be like a fast track to this enlightenment. Would you like? Would you agree or disagree with that statement? Yeah, I I put the intoxicants in quotations because like I still I still occasionally get drunk and stuff, you know. So mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I definitely yeah, and and psychedelics are a kind of whole different kettle of fish really it's like um i think uh yeah they're not a fast track um Mm. they're not a fast track in my opinion because what they do um is they can they can basically wake you up in a way like for a for a period of time but they don't necessarily give you the tools to to know that for for any extended amount of time after that so it's like it's kind of like you're being teleported to this whole new space and then teleported back it it's not necessarily giving you the the it can completely open your eyes i think that's why it's so psychedelics are so good is because people people who would fucking just just say like you are totally making this up and like you're just deluded and none of this works it's just all religious nonsense can take psychedelics and be like okay something is going on like this is really something way beyond what i was expecting and so a lot of people i think get into spirituality through psychedelics and that is that's really great i like totally i'm into that and um but i don't think that there are sustainable way of becoming more enlightened necessarily it's like uh yeah it that's just my opinion i haven't met many people that have had a sustained psychedelic like just do psychedelics again and again and again and again and have like somehow woken up from that there may be people but a lot of people is a gateway to Mm -hmm. to exploring other things Mm -hmm. yeah that's in like what we're talking about before about how Buddhism is more kind of life affirming, and there is like an aspect of that that that's like uh, written in Buddhism. For instance, do you know like the um the ten ox herding pictures in Zen Buddhism, where it's like it shows like the progress, and it's like all like the idea of being a bodhisattva, where like you you attain like uh, enlightenment, but you don't like drift off into nirvana. You kind of come back to the world, and there's like an element of like circularity in it, where like you. Mm-hmm you kind of, you return to like the hero's journey almost, like you return to being an ordinary person at the end and you become like a bodhisattva and re-enter the world. And that, mm. there's, there's not really a similar thing to that in like Christianity or something because in those kind of religions, it's all about getting to heaven and kind of moving on. There's, it, Buddhism and those kind of religions seem unique in the way that the kind of, at the end of, at the total end of your spiritual development, you just return to being an ordinary person kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's quite unique. Yeah, yeah. And that's inter- that's what 
the Buddha did, like God knows what he actually did, but that's the story of the Buddha, you know, it's like that he becomes enlightenment and there's a, he becomes enlightened and, and there is a moment where he's like, well, you know, it's a lot of work to go back into the world and I could just go off and, and just, you know, do my own thing basically, but it's like out of compassion, he then actually goes into the world and, and teaches because that's going to benefit a lot more people. And so, so right plumbed in right from the beginning is this, is this idea that, you know, you come back, you know, like you don't just wake up and then just kind of, okay, <laughs> see ya. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, all there for my questions. Are you got any more questions? Aaron? Um, I've got, I've got quite a few topics that I want to <laughs> like, touch on. So first off with that, the Buddha, like, aren't there many, there's many different Buddhas, isn't there? Like, isn't it like thousands? Like maybe I'm wrong in this book. Aren't there like thousands of Buddhas? And like, when was the last time someone actually became a Buddha? First bit, I definitely can't answer. Um, okay. Yeah, just because that's, again, more kind of factual knowledge of yeah. which I don't retain. But um, the last time someone, again, it's, it's, it's who you ask. You know, I'm, I'm definitely of the opinion that, like, there are people, Eckhart Tolle included, that are enlightened mm -hmm. now on the planet. Like, and it's probably more ordinary than we would expect. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of Buddhists really wouldn't have that view, you know? Um, yeah. and I think, um, cause what are the fact that like there's different factions in like Buddhism, um, do they fight a lot. Like, so like there'd be Zen Buddhists on one hand and like other types of Buddhists on the other hand, like, um, do they fight a lot or? Like, yeah, or there's, they are very different. So it's, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, there's another saying which is like, um, we're Buddhists, not Buddhas, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, there is a real humanness to the Buddhist community as a whole, you know, it's just like, there is bickering and like anything that you're going to see in all ordinary society will be in Buddhism. Like, I think <clears throat> one, um, misconception that people have which is purely just because there's not yeah i don't know there's still i guess being around buddhists is is kind of rare for for most people so they they have certain views of what buddhism is which are just stereotypes really of like peacefulness and da 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 it's like my experience of buddhism isn't that it's it's um it's very human, just there are arguments, there are kind of, there's gossip and all sorts of stuff goes on. I think the aspect that I've noticed that um, remains, yeah, that kind of, that is, that does really pick um, Buddhists out, I guess, is I'd say it probably comes under wisdom in that yes there's all these kind of there's all this stuff going on but people are willing to have conversations and people are willing to um to not necessarily be comfortable all the time and there's definitely yeah i think there's a certain level of openness and stuff so even though so yeah in terms of buddhist differences it's like god the differences are massive you know it's like um like what is it so uh there's theravada and, and mahayana mahayana buddhism and theravada buddhism um and theravada buddhism is called like the lesser vehicle you know for enlightenment so like even in, and it's kind of a, a nickname for this particular tradition of, of buddhism which is very very old and it's literally called by a huge portion of the buddhist community the lesser vehicle like this this just doesn't work as well you know you know what yeah. were you gonna say like, uh, i was about to say that's a bit tight you know like that's like honestly like i didn't know there was like 
I knew there were differences, but I didn't know there was like vitriol like that saying that this is the worst form. Like, but <laughs> then again, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Then again, um, like when pursuing such a like theory and stuff, when pursuing such like lofty like goals, I guess like the enlightenment of people, like here there is definitely gonna be that level of like you know, divi- like division. I'm I'm curious about another like another subject. Um, that I'm sure that not all Buddhists agree on. Um, have you heard of the concept of tulpas or not? Uh, rings a bell. I'm, I'm um, not sure. Explain. Well, like, I think you, you kind of can, you know, within your head, you can create another consciousness. You can kind of create, like, you know, another consciousness with its own identity, its own thoughts, its own feelings, its own personality. And mm. it can be kind of like, it's kind of like a split personality or like dissociative identity disorder, but except you have control over it. It's like another consciousness you can talk to within your body. So the mind can like, you know, create other consciousnesses. Like do, would Buddhists like disagree on that concept? Cause it's just something I found interesting. Mm, uh, yeah, I don't know. I've never, I've never heard of them before. Um, a lot is possible with, the mind and what you can do with the mind i'd yeah like but i'm not sure not sure um <clears throat> i don't really have much more to say or like ask so i guess we can wrap it up here um yeah that sounds good cool yeah, like, anyway. so. <laughs> <laughs> but i was about to say um Ended it prematurely there sorry <laughs> yeah there's one <clears throat> yeah there's one more thing i, oh, I sure. have to ask i just remembered um I had one more question. Um, was there any one experience that you had that really, like, you know, changed you? That I was like, this is, I want to do this because, like, I actually went to, you know, Mount Koya in Japan? Mm-hmm. Like, the top, um, it's like, isn't it like the biggest, like, you know, Buddhist community in Japan or something? Or correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure. Not sure, but. I was about to say, like, because I went, like, I had an experience when I went to Mount Koya. Like, mm. what happened was I, on a trip to Japan, I decided to stay actually at a Buddhist monastery, at a Buddhist center for a night, you know, like, and then we kind of, I kind of went on like a little walk around like the temple. Like this Buddhist tour guide like showed us around like, you know, Buddhist like, practices. And there was this moment where he started doing this mantra and I, I close my eyes during the mantra to really take it in and I really felt myself just being absorbed with into the mantra absorbed within mm. to like you know just myself like just I had an experience where I kind of took myself like out of the world really like mm. and it was a real like awakening for me like mm. I mean I'm not completely like Buddhist or spiritual but before I was like quite a materialist like and now I start, like, I start, I want to look into, like, spiritualism, like, more. Mm. I would say you've had, like, any, sp- like, similar, like, one experiences. Wow. And one experience. That sounds, that sounds really cool. It's really nice that with that one that you weren't expect. it wasn't something you cultivated or you were kind of expecting, I guess. So no. that's really awesome. Um, Have you had any experiences like that or not? Yeah, like, yeah, no, no, I... I have like a lot, but it's, um, I guess I'd talk about the, f- the first one feels most appropriate somehow. Um, yeah. So I read this book, uh, by Eckhart Tolle, yeah. uh, a new, a new earth. And I, th- mm-hmm. I was, I was like 17 at the time and, um, something about this book, I don't like it. It just made so much sense to me and things were kind of clicking into place about the, how humans function so it was quite conceptual it's just things just like oh my god this just all makes so much sense and this emphasis on on presence in this book uh, on just being here and the fact that the future and past actually don't exist you know i've, I've never experienced either of them um and I was walking to college and 
basically just had this experience of like really rich sense of of being here it was just like everything was all the i was walking through a park and like literally everything was so vivid it was just like so 3d and kind of right like i literally felt like i'd never been alive before really it was just so you know and, and my mind had kind of almost gone off or my thinking mind had almost gone offline so i was almost like a kind of newborn baby in a way just looking around this park like oh my god like i've never seen this before you know uh, and again it was i wasn't really expecting it and it really took me off guard but i think that was that was really what um confirmed to me that there was something more going on than what I could think about really mm -hmm. what my mind could offer so yeah I mean um I guess that's a good place to actually wrap, wrap it up you know mm -hmm. like um Oscar it's been brilliant having you on um I've loved learning more about Buddhism um, maybe I'll come along to the center sometime that sounds great be happy to have you yeah, cheers. Mm -hmm. Next meeting in cool. like weeks or something. Oh, yeah. I should say where, where you can find the uh, Young Buddhist group on Facebook. Uh, there's a Facebook group where you can join to, um, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will. I'm just going to get up, up the actual name so I always get the order confused. So it's MBC Young Buddhists. And yeah, you can just ask to join and um, and then I'll confirm that and then say hello. So, yeah, right. feel free to come along. Thanks so much. All right, I'm going to end it. Okay.